looking at, at the examples that our speakers have given and, and that we introduced at the beginning, uh, the material characteristics that, that seem to go around um, kind of all of the substances we've been dealing with um, to some extent um, can be summarized something like this. They're unbounded. It's difficult to kind of define a discrete unit of substance um, except arbitrarily. Um, you know, here's your stratum boundary or whatever. Um, they're often fluid. Uh, they move differently than things. They flow, they fix, they unfix, uh, they flow again. Um, many of them are heterogeneous, uh, made up of different components, and the, qu the qualities of the mixture emerge from the mixture itself, not from any individual element. Um, substances are permeable. Uh, their surfaces have this kind of promiscuous way of interacting with the world. They actively incorporate new material into themselves, and if they come in contact with the surface, they end up um, all over that surface as well. Um, substances are self-transforming and active. They have their own processes, and they change over time. Um, and where substance can be less resistant um, kind of on the surface than things, they're often more obstinate in, in their own way. Um, you, know, you can cut through water, but you can't really keep water in one place uh, for too long unless you freeze it. Yeah, and, and drawing from these characteristics that we, that we observed, uh, we really thought that we were, well, since we, we are thinking as, as well, material culture people, um, well, we, we have been trying to use those into, well, the, the thinking frameworks we normally think through. Uh, so those are materiality, uh, practice theories, and phenomenology. So it's, it's mainly through these three avenues that we are trying to look at substances and wrap up everything we heard about uh, just, just now. Um, whoops, that's not what I intended to do. Um, yes, and one of well, one of the first approaches that, that came to our mind was really, really these characteristics really impact our lives. And one of the best examples we have from that is when we dig, we find shirts and pieces of containers and containers and more vessels. They are just everywhere because to handle substances, we need tools, and these tools are very often containers. Um, Obviously, there are mediums to interact with substances, but, but they also impact our practices towards uh, substances. And, and these actions, these practices we actually engage with when we interact with substances are not the same as when we, we interact with only objects. So we, we figured out five verbs that are en encompassing all these, all these actions that are happening with between human substances and basically the rest of the material real. Uh, the first of them is mixing, which is quite important since, since qualities are changing when you mix different matters. Uh, mud bricks are a pretty good example because if you try to build a house only of sand, only of chaff, or only of clay, well, it's not gonna last. But if you mix the three of them in a proper balance, you'll make mud bricks and your wall can last like thousands of years. Uh, the same goes with food, uh, like you mix them first before you eat it, and then your body mixes it again, and well, all the outcomes are quite different. Um, <laughs> containing, we just, uh, we just covered it, so we need to contain uh, substances to manipulate them most of the time. Then uh, spreading is also something, well, it, it's kind of a verb that enhances uh, some of the properties of like lotion or butter, for example, or paint. Um, then fixing and fixing, we kind of talked about it, and Mark just well <laughs> brought us into the into the topic. But uh, and slides as well, it's a bit the same. You want to unfix something to change the property, use it, and then it refixes because it has natural property. Same with candles. I mean, it's it's kind of nice that wax holds for you to hold the candle, but you also want it to unfix so you get the warmth and uh, and and the light from it. And the last one is cleaning. Um, well, there are substances that accumulate in places or ways you don't want to see them, like snow in your driveway or dust on your floor, so you will remove it, but it kind of happens to be there by itself. So these are kind of the five main interactions we have with substances. Um, however, well, we do engage with substances, but they also do things by themselves. <laughs> um, because when, when we think of, of these of these interaction and actions that humans perform when they interact with substances, um, 
well, the, we only impact a part of it, actually, because substances have some sort of intrinsic activeness, like snow that falls in your driveway, for example, and it self transform as well. Um, and, and a good example of that is compost. I mean, if you, if you have an <coughs> aggregation of table waste, if you leave it there, it's going to rot and transform into compost. But you can also encourage it and put it in your compost bin and, and oxygenate, uh, oxygenate it and, and put it in a black bin so it, it goes faster because you want to use compost. But whatever you do, it's going to compost. Uh, it, the reverse is possible as well. If you have milk, you want it to remain milk and not like rotten, clotted something. <laughs> so you put it in the fridge and you can uh, refrain that process. But whether you like it or not, it will at some point rot. So this is also part of our well, interaction and practices uh, regarding uh, substances. So yeah, in short, our practices are influenced by material properties, intrinsic activeness, and self-transformation. Um, thanks. And, and like, uh, like all practices, these get bound up in discourses and bound up in the ways people think through things or think through substance to get out the world. Um, there's often ideas about uh, right practice and wrong practice with substance, but also metaphorically we engage with um, much of the world through substances as much as we do with things. Um, so we brought up the idea of right mixture. A mud brick's only strong with the right recipe. If you want to recreate that pot, you need the right mixture to get that quality um, out of it. And this can be a very kind of pragmatic thing um, to get a strong mud brick, but people also think through this metaphorically. Um, on, on the right there is an image from Chattahoyak where a wall has been slumping and leaning and, and not strong and people have tunneled in at the base of it and added some obsidian blades which um, could perhaps be an effort to add something to the mix of a wall that isn't working. Um, so there's right mixture, there's wrong mixture, and there's ideas of um, contamination, uncleanness, um, that we deal with pragmatically um, to a great extent, but also symbolically people elaborate on, on the right as a mikvah, a Jewish ritual bath for, um, among other uses for women who have menstruated and need to be purified of, of this contaminating bodily substance before engaging in social life again. And these logics can shift and change um, even in, in, in a population over time, you know, do you allow the Nile to flood every year and spread silt everywhere and erase land boundaries? Or do you try to discipline the Nile, contain it within banks, uh, turn it into some sort of a regular, predictable, almost thing-like um, landmark? Um, so again, there's this kind of shift towards an ob preferring an object world, a bounded world in the 20th century, um, shift in the cultural logic around substance. Um, and it puts people in a sort of adversarial relationship with um, the agency of substances, like snow in, in, <coughs> in Ethiopia with water, with silt. Yes, and, and this agency of substance well, acts beyond human practice. We kind of covered that a bit already. But there are two, two main processes that, that are really active with or without human, but do affect us. Uh, the first one is obstinacy. obstinacy. Um, we've got the example of soil against tarmac, because, because really substances do what substances do. Like they, they naturally follow their characteristics. And even with the best engineered tarmac, if you don't care about it, you don't fix it, well, soil will move, life will live, and water will flow through. And at some point, you will end up with half a field and half tarmac if you don't care about it, because substance is obstinate. And the other one is temporality. And, and you can really observe or actually understand temporality through the process of promiscuous integration. Uh, this happens in the short time and in the long term as well. Uh, in the short time, this is very often experienced in a mix that you cannot unmix, and then it happens in a second and, and it's done. Uh, like if the, <laughs> if the salt falls in the soup and it's too salty, well, you're done. Uh, in the long term, uh, this is, it's a process that kind of accumulates, and well, we're all familiar with sedimentation when we dig, <laughs> that's, that's what we remove, but we all have 
uh, as Agni said, like this, this wonderful, perfect site that is layered like a cake, but when you actually excavate it, it's, it's all mixed and it's like a whole turmoil that happened there. And, and all of these processes that happened one after the other are all compressed. And that's why we're, what we're trying to unmix. <laughs> but even if you see everything, you cannot unmix it all. So that, that's a bit how we interact with it, basically. And uh, well, like, like from all these characteristics too, that we engage with substances, I'm sorry if you're hungry, um, well, is, is very much a bodily experience. And that's why phenomenology is, is an avenue that we need to consider uh, when, when we think about subst substances. Because if you, if you visualize your interaction with, interactions with things, they're pretty direct and linear. Um, like you, you start an action, there is a result, and that's it. Um, and, and we also understand these experiences with things uh, like through, through action and function and, and context, like, like Heidegger's hammer. Like you're hammering the nail and there you have a hammer. Like it's very simple, but that's the idea. But with substances, it doesn't work like that. Because if you just look at this picture, well, you have no idea if it's cold or like burning hot or if it's sweet or spicy. You just can't know because you cannot engage with the substance because it's a picture. So, so this relationship needs to be central. Like you really need to put your body in contact with the substance. And that can be scary as well. <laughs> but uh, but that, that needs to be part of a reflection because because we need to feel it and it and, and as well, I mean using food as an example is not innocent because because it also mixes in your body. Like it, it's a complete <laughs> complete experience actually. Um, so yeah, in short, like substances require a more direct and global engagement with thing uh, than things do with, with humans, basically. And uh, this type of engagement is impactful on people and their daily life. And we're very conscious that the experience we live today in contact with substances are very different than from than the ones people experience in the past, but we still need to deal with it because <laughs> we're in the future. And we also are very conscious that the, the past world was probably much more made of substance than ours. As we said, ours is very much like clear, defined, and thingy. And yeah. So it's easy to see how this can quickly go beyond phenomenology even and beyond human experience. Um, to something a little bit more political. Um, substances demand that we engage with them synesthetically, with our skin, with our nose, with our ears. Um, as you're working the clay, I imagine you hear it and you smell it, and, um, and all of this tells you something about the process that's going on. Um, and this gets to be something a bit like uh, what Tim Ingle calls the weather world. Um, he critiques kind of phenomenologists who paint the world as an observer within a structured universe um, and, and makes the case that the real world taken as an aggregate in its entirety as, as we zoom out and take a broader perspective is much more of a substance than a thing or a collection of things. Um, the weather world, as he calls it, is something that you have to engage with synesthetically. You have to engage with its temporalities, its processes, its life. Um, and it can be collaborated in, um, but not controlled, at least not wholly or for long. Um, and we proposed that at the very beginning that in the 21st century we're living in a, a world of things, in, in an object world. Um, but this challenges us to question that insight. Um, the world of things is very much the world of capital. It's the world of um, the current power structures of our day and age. Um, it tells us that things can be bounded and owned, parceled out to different people who are bounded agents, bounded actors. It tells us that our responsibility for interacting with things ends with our mechanical, physical contact with them. Our substance world invites us to look beyond that mechanical interaction, to look at um, this synesthetic, this diachronic interaction with the flow of all materials as they fix and unfix, bind and unbind into more or less thing-like stuff over time. Um, 
I mean, to put it frankly, we're, we're in many ways wrecking our world right now because we're trying to treat it as things that can be parceled out and owned. Um, and maybe the present is a bit of an archaeological problem in that way. We need to deal with substances better in every, every sphere of our life, deal with stuff that won't be things a little bit better. And as a bit of context, that's uh, Northern Alberta, tar sand expl exploitation. That's the yeah, post-apocalyptic framework of that. <laughs> so on, on the note of substances wrecking the world, um, or, or things wrecking the world, um, I think on that cheery note, we should open the floor up to general discussion. Um, any questions that are lingering for individual presenters should um, be raised. Yeah, there um, were two questions for Mark, I think, that uh, wanted to be asked. But then especially if you have questions or ideas or thoughts on, on how, how we can trace common threads among the different presentations we've had today, um, it'd be much appreciated. Mm -hmm.